fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Good on 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 1050 AM Palm Springs. Well, welcome back into the house of mystery. I'm Al Warren. Mr. Joe Goldberg. It's a serious day when Joe's in the room. I'm in, I'm in the room. I'm ever so serious as I drink my diet beverage and come off like you have of a writing binge. Diet beverage? I thought you were into the bubbles. Uh, I do this. This is it's a diet beverage made on Soda Stream. I recommend the Soda Stream. I, I, I live on it. <laughs> I can't help it. Yeah, I can imagine. I, I need something bubbly like you. I need something around me that's bubbly. Yeah, yeah I'm not bubbly enough for you. Jeez. Well, that's why we have to have Bruce on, because Bruce, as you know, his nickname is Effervescent. Yes, that's exactly right. <laughs> Well, you know, uh, I, that's what I've heard, but I, I didn't want to say that. I well, let's find out. Let's ask him, you know, Bruce, are you a professor? Well, I've, I've had enough Diet Coke to make me that way. <laughs> well, well, now, uh, Bruce is our guest today. He is Bruce. <laughs> yeah, obviously, I don't want to say it, but Mr. Bruce Borges. He is so gorgeous. His new book, The Bitter Past, A Mystery, is the Porter Bet Book One. So uh, thank you for being here first. Thanks for having me. really appreciate it. Well, Bruce, so what drew you into this world of writing, this this unstable, insecure world of writing? Why would you do that? <laughs> that's a great question. You know, that's the first time I think anybody's asked me it that way. <laughs> and I don't really I don't really know the answer to that except that I'm you know, I'm partly insane. Only partly. Because you're right. It is it's unstable and it's uncertain. And it's uh, filled with, I mean, it's a land mine of, uh, or a, a minefield of, of, you know, potential pickups and explosions and uh, uh, sometimes not a lot of fun. But, but you know, for all of us who do it, I think we enjoy it a great deal. And uh, I'm happy to be spending this part of my life doing that. I, I just, before we get into your book, I was just wondering when I was reading your bio, did you ever go after your old guidance counselor that said you'll never be an astronaut? Because it's because of that kind of reinforcement, you're not an astronaut. Right, right. And, uh, you know, I, I wish I, I kind of wish I could have, you know, found him. I'm sure he's, he was pretty elderly, as I recall at the time, and that was, you know, 40 plus years ago. So he may be long gone, but, uh, it would have been nice to say, you know what? You're right. I didn't become an astronaut, but this is what I'm doing. Well, you know, you could you can kill him off in your That's book. That's true. I might do that. <laughs> That's what you got to do. Yeah. I might do that. Okay, so now you are in the world of mystery here. So you've got Porter Beck, book one. So who is Porter Beck? Like, how do you describe that character? So Porter Beck is a recently retired Army officer who uh, spent his time predominantly as a foreign area officer, which means that he was predominantly a specialist in certain parts of the world and did a lot of intelligence work. And he has returned uh, recently to Lincoln County, Nevada, where his father had been the sheriff for several decades and where he has recently taken over that job. It's a very rural county. Uh, Lincoln County is a real place. Um, it sits just north of Las Vegas in Clark County. Um, it has about 6,000 people, and it is 11,000 square miles. So it's about the size of the state of Maryland. And the sheriff's department there, which Porter Beck is, is running, um, is uh, uh, comprised by, you know, anywhere from 10 to 15 officers at a time. So it's a huge area to cover geographically with a very small – uh, or as I like to refer to it as a Boy Scout troop size department. So you have this character, Porter Beck, and you have Nevada, and you have the topic behind your book, which you can, which you should, and you can explain. Did you have the topic of the book first, which is kind of way I leave when I look at it, or did you have your character first? You're trying to, you're trying to find a character in a story. Do you have a story that's going to find some characters that the build as I'm writing a story? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I actually had the story idea first. And, and what I was thinking was, 
You know, I've been in Nevada most of my life, uh, and a lot of people aren't very aware of that part of our history, which a good part of the book involves, which is the 1950s and the atomic testing that went on above ground in the Nevada desert, about 75 miles north of Las Vegas, in what is now still a very highly secret classified area. So I had this idea that, you know, I'd love to just dive into that time period. And I always wondered, you know, I wonder how much the Soviets were trying to get, find a way into the Nevada test site to spy on our atomic program, just like they had been at Los Alamos and some other places. Um, but I didn't want to write uh, a nonfiction book because there are plenty of those about that era and about what we were doing out there. And I thought that, okay, well, if I write this entirely in the past, um, it might not be as relevant to, you know, younger readers today. So I thought, I'll write a dual timeline story back in the 1950s and, and mostly in the present day with this sheriff in Lincoln County. And that's how I came up with his character. I thought, well, if I'm going to do this, you know, partly in the present, I need a character, a, a very strong protagonist who's got some good background, who can investigate some things, a very smart guy, and... Um, uh, that's kind of how I arrived at coming up with, you know, kind of initially sketching out. So was historical fiction your target type of book when you started it? You know, no, I, I, I would say yes, um, partly. I mean, I certainly wanted to write a historical fiction novel, but I really wanted it to be a mystery that involved, you know, some, some murder, some espionage, because that's, that's what I love to read historical fiction too, um, that aren't, parts of those other genres. But, um, you know, I thought this, this could be a good combination. So I knew that when I started outlining the story, I needed something very compelling to happen in the present. And so what I did was I created the beginning or the opening chapter to be to involve this murder of a retired FBI agent, kind of a, just a brutal, gruesome murder of this guy. And in Lincoln County, there is not a lot of murder. I actually think the opening line in the book is we don't have a lot of murder in Lincoln County because that's true. Uh, so it's, it's quite an anomaly to see this there. And it really kind of sets some things in motion um, and, and kind of points Porter back when, he, when he's at the crime scene. Some of the things he sees there kind of point him back to his previous life in the Army and his time spent in Russia. So all of that kind of tied neatly together for me and in coming up with how this story was going to involve two different timelines and kind of meet in the middle. Well, there's a couple of questions there. Let's go with the two timelines. How did you uh, handle, juggle, doing a mindset of two different timelines and the, I guess, the themes, topics, or issues, or story development for each one of those periods that are connected to each other? Yeah, I hadn't done one of those yet. I'd written two previous novels, um, which are entirely different, not even mysteries, but... Um, I, I had read a lot of, uh, especially when you see how the author is able to bring the past and the present together or whatever two timelines they might be writing about. So I knew that was going to be a challenge. And I almost, it's almost like writing two different books. I suppose that even though I wrote it in a linear fashion, meaning that I started in the present and I began with a couple of chapters about this murder and things that were going on. And then I jumped back to the past and I wrote it, you know, kind of going back and forth between the two timelines. I probably could have written it the other way and written everything in the, in the present, uh, on the one side and then everything in the past and then figure out where I was going to combine them. It just, it just worked for me that I didn't have to do that, but it is like writing two different books. So it's, it's interesting to, to juggle those things. And as you guys know, when you write about things that happened in the past, you have to be careful about what you say, not only from a, a research standpoint and getting the history correct, but all of the incidental things. Um, and, you know, what kinds of weapons did people use? Um, what kinds of technology did they have available to them? You know, we have regular phones. We didn't have cell phones. Um, so there are, there are all of those things that you need to constantly check on. And I spent, I spent much more time researching those parts of the past 
than I did on researching things that I had in the present. That's really important because you've got to get the, the feel because there is a lot of young people and if they read it, they won't. They never lived it, so they don't understand a lot of things. An older person would that's right. been around. So you've got to explain a lot of things. Your, your character itself, what tense? We were talking about this before um, going on air, first person, third person, like the di different situations and where you're writing from. How do you write your characters? You know, I am a huge fan of Craig Johnson and C.J. Box and a number of other guys who write about the best in contemporary times. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, all of Craig Johnson's Longmire books are written in the first person. And that's where I started. And that's actually where I ended up for Porter Beck. So all of the present parts of the book are narrated by him uh, in the present tense. And I found that that worked well, most especially uh, to reveal how kind of clever he is in his thinking. So he's, he's just to give you a little bit more background on him, he's, he's a sharp guy. He, he comes, again, from a rural part of Nevada, and Nevada generally, outside of Las Vegas, you know, is a pretty rural state. So he comes from kind of a ranching community and, um, you know, a lot of animals. Uh, but he's, he's not any kind of a country bumpkin. He's extremely intelligent. He speaks several languages. He um, thinks on his feet very well. Um, but he also has uh, a physical kind of a disability. Um, and I, you know, I'll, 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 I'll tell you basically what it is. Um, and he learned this. Uh, and it's eventually what drove him out of the army a little a little bit before he wanted to get out. But he has night blindness. He cannot see in the dark. He can see pretty darn well during the day, pretty normally. But when the lights go out, where it's very low light, everything narrows to it's you know very much like tunnel vision, and he he cannot see. So it presents some unique challenges to him in a law enforcement role. And initially in the in the book, um, he's thinking that. You know, he hasn't told anybody about this, um, so he's hoping that no one else <laughs> notices. But it becomes pretty obvious at a certain point. How much, how much of your own self do you think goes into that character? You know, I think I, I tried to impart what I believe my sense of humor is into him. Um, and I think most, most, of my, most of the readers uh, who um, either reviewed it or just informally told me their feelings on the book, who knew me, said, yeah, okay, he's got your sense of humor, um, which is really why I, I just wanted a guy who was kind of fun. He's not he's not a stereotypical sheriff in any way, shape, or form. He doesn't wear a uniform. Uh, he pretty much wears, a, you know, blue jeans and a Carhartt jacket uh, most of the time. Um, so he's he's kind of outside the what you'd, you know, you'd see in a, a typical rural sheriff role. Um but, uh, you know, I, I tried to give him some sense of myself, but I didn't try to, I didn't really focus on um, trying to make him like me. I mean, he's got experience that I don't have. I was not in the military, um, but I just tried to make him a guy who was uh, very quick on his feet, uh, very intelligent, very observant. Well, Bruce, let me ask you a question. Anybody who listens does ask questions that help me. Because I'm doing research right now on some topics I don't know. You're in, the, in Nevada, and you have a topic of you know, nuclear bombs and deaths. And how, how did you research? Did you go and talk to the sheriff? Did you go talk to nuclear physicists? How, how much did you go out? How much did you talk? How much you got into the book? Yeah, it was, as you can imagine, it was an essential part of this book because, he, you know, I, I knew what I thought was I'm a history buff, so I knew quite a bit about that period in our history. And, and being this close to the Nevada test site, um, uh, and knowing quite a few people who had worked out there in the past, I, I had some good background. So I spent, first of all, um, yeah, I took a few trips up to Lincoln County. I met the uh, sheriff there at the time. He's, so I, uh, I did that. I spent a lot of time up there kind of, you know, physically, visually scoping out the geography. And I've been there quite a few times before, but getting a better physical sense of the area. And then, uh, in learning more about, uh, our, our nuclear program at the time out here in the Nevada desert, which, again, you know, most people, I had no idea that between 1950 and 1960, we set off, uh, you know, 100 nuclear bombs above ground. 
And so uh, I wanted to learn more about all of those different tests that we did and when they happened and how big they were in terms of nuclear yield um, and what the effects of those explosions were. You know, most of us have heard what has happened with the people who lived downwind of the test site, which predominantly was mostly east of, of the site, a little bit south as well. Eventually that radiation expanded and it spread all over the globe. But for the people who lived due east of the site, um, there were some, some effects that they are still suffering and are being compensated from the government because of that. I spent time talking to those people. I went out to eastern Utah. I, I called some people. I got some uh, great information from the university here in Las Vegas and their archives department who had actually interviewed uh, downwinders over the years and kept those recordings because a lot of those people have passed on. Um, but I did the same for, for people who worked out at the test site during that time as well because their recordings were captured. So I got a great sense of the security uh, that was in place at the time and what they did, the measures they took to keep people who had no business being out there from, from being being around the site um, and, and what physically uh, they had out there at the time. Um, and I spent a lot of time at the Fantastic Museum. If you ever get to Vegas and you want to you wanna spend some time learning about that stuff, it's, it's a great place. Uh, and they were super in, uh, super helpful in, in kind of guiding me, uh, around the place and going through their old documents and helping me gain a better understanding of, uh, you know, the types of things that, and, and events that happened out there in that decade. And that's actually how I stumbled onto the real project, an actual nuclear test that took place in 1957 that I used in the book. So how much of the research we did that big, fat first draft and ended up in the really skinny last draft? That's another great question. So as you well know, um, whenever you write historical things and you do all this research, you feel, you feel obliged or compelled to share it with the world. And you, you don't really have that opportunity. There was so much research and things that I discovered that, in, as you said, in my first draft was all in there. And then by the time I got around to the third or fourth draft, I had cut a significant portion out. And then by the time my, my editor at Minotaur Books got a hold of it and sent his thoughts back to me, we, we chopped some more out and just kept it to really what does the reader need to know about that time without boring them. Because, yeah, while it might have been fascinating to me, some of that detail is probably a little bit too much for, you know, the, average reader. Yeah, it becomes an information dump, right? It becomes, exactly, yeah. It becomes too much. You could always put that on your website. You yep. Know, some, oh, and I, I, I have done that to some extent, yeah. Oh, wait, so you planned this, like this is book one, so uh, do you kind of know how many books you're going to do and kind of have an outline of where you're going with your character and the stories? Well, yes, I do. I, uh, I originally had a two-book deal uh, to kind of bring Porter back to life. Um, that's been expanded, I think, predominantly because of the reaction that we've gotten on the first book. So there'll be multiple Porterbeck books. Uh, it remains to be seen how many. Um, and we've got some other things in the works that I can't really talk about at this point. But, um, yeah, they're going to be around for a while, and I have some really good ideas. As a matter of fact, the second book, which is called Shades of Mercy, uh, comes out in July. So it's already in the can and is actually going out to... Uh, some folks for early reviews now. Um, and then I'm currently about 100 pages into the first draft of book three. A writing man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dallas, I feel so so wet like a slob. <laughs> <laughs> we, don't we all feel that way? I saw like, how prolific some of these people are, and I'm just going, oh, my God, I just can't do anything remotely that fast. Don't you sleep? Bruce, are there themes inside these books? Is there something? I mean, it's historical fiction, which – it lends itself to say we need to learn something from history. Is, is that in there, or are these more story plots? Well, I think, I think yes. In, in book one, and, and keep in mind that the only book that right now is going to be historical fiction is book one because it has that uh, past timeline that runs parallel to the, the present one. Uh, my, my next few books probably will all be in the present, at least as I've outlined them so far. 
but um, I, I think that's probably how it's going to progress at this point. Bruce, can I ask a question about your secondary characters? How do you fit them into the main character in the story? Were they part of fiction, historical fiction, or were they just some of them just built to be a support network or to show the character and development of your main character? Well, I, I, you know, for the, I obviously had to invent the entire world in the 1950s, uh, and all of those characters, I, I really have one central character in that past timeline who, yes, has a supporting cast, um, but I, 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 you know, it it wasn't something that um, I had in mind when I got started. I just knew that I needed a main character who, who and I'll tell you who he is. He's a he's a Russian spy. He's a Soviet spy who comes to the United States in 1955. And so I I just tried to build him as I thought uh, would make sense for the time. And t- so kind of going back to the previous question. The uh, the theme that I have in book one really is that, without spoiling anything for anybody here, um, that a lot of who we, you know, the decisions that we make in life uh, seem to be dependent on where we're born and where we're raised. It's a matter of geography. And patriotism is another thing that kind of is in the eyes of the beholder. You know, everybody who puts on a uniform for their country probably believes that they're a patriot and they're doing the right thing. And most of the time, those lines do not get blurred. Sometimes they do. And I tried to incorporate that into the story uh, because I think it's very relevant, not only to what happened in the past, but even today. Well, let me continue off my selfish questions. When you take that, those themes that you're building for those characters and sort of the twists and turns that are sort of inherent in this book that what happens, who is, who is what doing what, what's wrong with them. How did you sketch those out? How, were they there? Did they develop? Uh, did you plan them out, or did they just come from somewhere? Because I'm working on that right now. Yeah, I, 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 I tried to plan them out the best I could ahead of time. So I, I create typically very detailed biographical, biographical sketches of all the characters, even the, the minor characters. So I really have a good sense of, what kind of person they are and where they come from and what they think and how they feel about certain things so that I can maintain some continuity throughout the story. And I don't, I don't have a character do something that seems to be out of line with other things that I've, I've said about him. So I, I did my best to create all of them ahead of time and know very clearly in my mind who they were. Um, that didn't always work out. I did make some adjustments as I went. But for the most part, that cast of characters remained pretty true to what I had imagined at the beginning. How about the idea of you know, the process of revealing the twists and turns? Well, that happened a little bit more organically, I think, as I started writing. I did, I did my best, and again, I'm I'm one of those plotters um, who who outlines a great deal before I get started on a draft. And I did my best to to try to figure out, okay, where do I need a twist? Where do I need a turn? Where do I need a surprise? But then, as, as you guys know, you, you start writing and you get into the weeds, and all of a sudden you think of something that actually works better. Um, so I, I ran into that a, a few times, and that that's great. I mean, I, that that part of the process is wonderful that you can discover that along the way because you you as much as you might want to or you try to, you simply can't envision everything ahead of time. You kind of have to let your characters breathe some life into the story and then kind of see what happens. So how did you kill your guidance counselor? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, that's, that's coming up in, in book five. Yeah. <laughs> A long, long, <laughs> slow death. Well, well, listen, so why is Porter Beck a sheriff? Like why, why, why you do that with your main character? Why does he have to be a sheriff? Is there a meaning there? Um, no, not, not really. Um, he became a sheriff because he um, leaves the Army, as I mentioned, um, a little bit before he really wanted to. It's basically because of a, the, his medical condition. And he comes back, and again, it's there, there's not a lot of work in Lincoln County outside of government work. There's the rail system that goes through that transports a lot of goods back and forth. There's mining, um, and there's people who work for the state in various capacities. Uh, or, you know, there's those specific counties. 
Um, there's not, you know, and there's some ranching, obviously, that goes on and, and becomes uh, a bigger part of my that world in, in my next few books. But um, he becomes a sheriff mostly because he's had a great deal of experience now in, you know, working in the Army and doing a lot of intelligence type work. So some of this, you know, that kind of discovery and investigation and research uh, is a natural part of who he is, and the best place for that is the job that his father held for 30 years, which is sheriff. How do you, how do you experience these characters? Like when you're writing the dialogue, are you are you hearing them or seeing them, or what goes on in your your brain? Yeah, I try my best to hear them, and and I I I, I actually try to envision what those people look like. As a matter of fact, when I when I do my outlines, I I physically describe each character in my biographical sketch, and then I try to find a photo of somebody online, whether it's an actor or somebody else that I think that person looks like, because that helps me um, decide how they speak and how they act, uh, if I know what they look like and how they move. Um, so uh, I, I, I try to do that to the best I can, but I really do try to hear them as I as I'm writing, I, I go back a lot and I read it out loud, especially the dialogue parts, um, to see if, does this sound like quarterback or does this sound like Sana Locke, uh, who's a big part of book one. So, yeah, that's that's how I do it. And and your female characters, can, can you get into the heads of females and write them as a strong character and, and lead? <laughs> well, I guess that depends on who you ask. If you're asking me, <laughs> I would say yes. Um, but but it's funny, um, and, and I'm sure you guys have run into this. I, I got a few reviews from women who said that they thought Porter Beck was misogynistic and kind of crass in the way he he thinks about some of these female characters. Well, first of all, there's nothing in the book, I just want to set the record straight, that's disrespectful to women at, at all that they perceived the opposite of that is interesting to me and a little disturbing, but I did my best to kind of paint all of the female characters in my story as very strong women. And yeah, sure, I'm a guy and I don't, you know, I'm not a woman. So I, I uh, some of that I have to uh, imagine what it would be like and how a person would act, how a female character would act. But, but I also run it by some very uh, female beta readers that I have to say, and I say, tell me if if I'm doing something here with this character that seems out of whack to you. Well, I, I don't understand why, you know, if your character has some tendencies to be a certain way, that's who they are. Do you know what I mean? I, I don't think you should have to purify people to fit a narrative, no matter what it is, you know? Because characters are characters. They're not all, not everybody in this world is perfect. And uh, just just Joe, of course. You have to say just G, but it's, I thought you'd go first. <laughs> people are people. You know, we're flawed. We make mistakes. All right? And yeah. some people want to be aggravated by that, and that's why you have those kind of people, to aggravate them, to, to, to bring to light those characteristics of other kinds of people. Good and also to think of them not in 2024 time frames, but especially going back in the past, you're thinking of 1950s time frames. And, yeah. and, and those, those, those types of themes, that, there's your theme, is, is you know, no, nobody's perfect. Yeah. So, no. yeah, and to be real, because when you do cover something in the 50s, man, I'm, I'm working on stuff now in the, in the 50s and 60s, and I'm watching a lot of shows and game shows and live shows and news shows from then, and how they treat it and talk to Females then were it was it's just it's pretty pretty amazing. I'm surprised at how it was done, um, and everybody sort of thought it was fine. Right. So, but that's if you're going to be a realistic sort of point, it's time time point. It's you got to you got to be that way. You can't make everybody 2024. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and, and my character Porter Beck is he's a mid 40s guy who's unmarried. He's unattached. Um, when he sees a beautiful woman, he thinks about things that and kind of has an inner dialogue about how he observes her. It's not something he says out loud. He's not making jokes or saying inappropriate things. But he's thinking, you know, about, for instance, you know, where he and this uh, female FBI agent should get married. Um, and it's interesting that some people took offense to that. But it's realistic. I mean, I, I tur turn on a What's My Line from 62 
and a beautiful girl comes out and signs in. Everyone's whistling in the audience and yeah. and hooting and hollering, and, and everybody thinks it's fine. Nobody, nobody's offended. It just right. that's the way it was. So if you're going to bring someone back to that time, so that's how it was. Uh, it, I don't know. I'm I'm not big on purifying or changing things because it's not realistic. Well, it's the battle between you know, perception, reality, and being cliché. So as I'm writing along, I'll write cliché in red next to a character or a spot saying, this right. is just being easy. Yeah. Then you, then you turn it into reality and perception. And don't cancel yourself as you're writing. You're writing your own book. You're writing your own story. But that's the that's the battle. So as long as you're not cliche, it's like oh, there she checks her mirror and the makeup and make the well. That's what the character does. That's what the character does. I have a character who has has characteristics, but that's what they are. That defines who they are. It's that little piece. Not because I'm being a guy writing a female person. It's just that's who that person is. Like a guy would worry about what knife he carries or whatever. It is. His, you know, I'm going bald. Wow. Sorry about that. Yeah. In fact, Bruce, it's a terrible yeah. situation. Yeah. Anyway, so that's how I that's how I feel. I feel the tension. Do you feel the tension as you're writing it? I do. do feel, yeah. yeah. Everybody's standing on your chest. Your readers are standing on your chest, looking over your shoulder, going, "Ah, no, no, no." That's right. <laughs> well, how does that how does that experience change you? But like when you go through a series like this book, and all the research, all the work, you put it out there, and then you do get kind of reviews. You do get. You, there's a lot of noise around. And um, so how does each book, do you think, change you? Or do you, you know, and plus you're living through your characters. You're reading them out. You're being your character for a while. Does that experience kind of alter you in any way? No, I don't think so. I, I think, like you said, I, I, I try to stay uh, realistic with my characters and have them live real lives and experience real things and have real feelings um, that are human. And... Um, I am cognizant not doing anything that is going to be overly offensive uh, because pretty much I'm not that kind of person, um, and I don't want my characters to be that way. I might, you know, I might create a character at some point that is very well. Actually, in, in the first book, in the Bitter Past, I do have a, a deputy sheriff who's he's a racist, um, but th that's who he is, and I'm I make sure that he's true to his character. Um, but I try not to worry too much about the reactions of a very few readers. Um, they have their own tastes. I appreciate that or I respect that. I'm not going to please everybody. Not everybody is going to like, you know, my book or, or books. Um, and that's fine. But a lot of people do, so I'm, I'm happy about that. And I see, okay, so you've got nomination in the Left Coast crime thing that's happening in Seattle and stuff. Does that change how you continue to write does that put any pressure on you when something like that happens i think quite honestly the more pressure i feel is comes from my publisher and, and now having because i'm writing this series and i have a contract for it you know i have the deadline and uh, when you're writing uh kind of for yourself you don't have to worry about those things so i feel a little bit of pressure occasionally um especially while you're trying to market your current book or the next book that's coming out and balance that with your writing time so that's where I feel pressure. I don't, I don't feel any change or, um, you know, it's, it's nice to have that nomination. Um, and, and I hope we, we garner some others along the way, but that's, uh, I'm not focused on that at all. Right. Yeah. It's kind of one of those things. I think the less you pay attention to all that stuff, um, the better, you know, you can focus, focus on what you're doing rather than the stuff around you, you know? Yeah. Cause it is easy to get lost in that stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Go online and get to an argument with someone. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, listen, so that, that brings up, do you have a website? Do you do social media? Do you like to interact with readers? Do you get involved in that? And if so, how do people get a hold of you? So they can go to my website, which is just bruceborges.com. Um, and there's plenty of, uh, you know, there's a way to contact me if they want to reach out. I get a lot of people who do that uh, pretty often. Um and I have a newsletter that I do on there uh, occasionally, three or four times a year. Um, but I am pretty active on social media, as Joe knows. I'm on uh, X and I'm, I'm you know, very uh, present on Facebook and uh, a little bit less on Instagram, but I'm there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I try to do all of the things to, to have it. And I, I, I literally love it when somebody reaches out to me and says, 
read your book, and this, these are my thoughts on it. I love that kind of back and forth, whether it's online or it's in person at, you know, a, a book signing or some other event. I, I actually did a library event here in Las Vegas a couple of weeks ago, and uh, one person showed it. Um, and it was, it was interesting because, you know, they were expecting more, but it was the first beautiful day we had had here in some time. So I think most people were saying, I'm, I'm not going in, indoors, I'm going outside. And, uh, but it was nice to have this one gentleman there and we talked for an hour, um, cause he had already read the book and everything and he's just a library goer. But I love that kind of interaction. I thought you were going to say he was a guidance counselor. <laughs> Ah, terrible. So, so what's next? You got the second one in 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 the bag, so to speak, and and or you've got something else going on. What are you working on now? Yeah. So, Shades of Mercy, which is book two, comes out on July sixteenth, and it's a it's a really neat story that starts with the hijacking of a highly classified military drone um, over Lincoln County, which is again right next to Area fifty one, that very secretive area that. Uh, is controlled by the federal government. Um, and then it kind of, uh, it, it, it bleeds into a few other areas uh, and involves a girl named Mercy Vaughn, who's 16 years old, who's currently incarcerated at the Lincoln County Youth Center for committing some online um, computer crimes, uh, which seem fairly minor on their face, but it turns out that there's a lot more, there's a lot of people who are looking for her, and maybe she's not really who she says she is. And Mexican drug cartels and a foreign government uh, are also involved. Uh, so it's it's going to be interesting. Yeah. Do you, do, you, do you stay away from conspiracies, or do you get into them, or, you know, like Area 51 and things like that? Do you throw all that in there as well to kind of add tension, or do you stay away from that? No, I I. I actually try to throw some of that in. For instance, in, in The Bitter Past, I have a character who's a kind of out of favor investigative journalist um, who is referred to by the locals as X-Files um, because he's one of these guys who, um, you know, has, has uh, fully invested himself in the idea that there are UFOs being uh, hidden by the federal government out in the Nevada test site, and we actually have alien bodies. And and he's one of those people who has fallen into and and fully accepted that conspiracy. I don't I don't judge his beliefs. I I do treat him skeptically um, because most people do treat those people skeptically. Um, but he's a very important character, and some of the things that he has to say. Are very interested, are very interesting to Porter Beck and, and some other folks. So, uh, I think that's going to continue. And and fortunately for me, the Nevada desert and the fact that about 80% of all the land in Nevada is managed by the federal government in in some way, shape, or form, gives me lots of chances and lots of opportunities to get into some of those conspiracies. Do you stay away from headlines? There's kind of stuff in the news, um, modern stuff, or do you, do you don't want to touch that? I actually like headlines, um, and I use them quite often. I've used them in other books as well to at least uh, be a starting point for a story, and then I kind of take it and go, okay, well, how can I fictionalize this, and how can I make it something really, really interesting? Um, because a lot of headlines that we see about, you know, especially that involve technology around us, um, these things are, are, you know, probably going to be huge for us at some point. So I like to use those to whatever degree I can. Well, that's interesting. Well, anyway, um, so we'll have everything up on our website so people can find you easily and, uh, you know, and your book and your website and stuff. So appreciate you being, being here. Uh, your book is called The Bitter Past. It's a mystery, quarterback book one. And, of course, our guest is the author of that and many more. Check out his books. It's uh, Bruce Borges. Thank you for being here. Oh, thanks so much for having me, guys. I really appreciate the conversation. Thanks, Bruce. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night.
Something with media. I'll be back.